It's April the 17th. Let's read the Bible. Welcome back, friends. Glad to have you with us on this year-long journey from January to December. The whole Word of God, the whole Bible in just one year. Glad to have you along with us. Glad you have hopped on the Bible bus. I hope you're enjoying this uh, every time, every single time I do one of these readings with you. I, I never do it, but that God shows me something else in his word that I hadn't seen before, including sometimes passages that I have studied many times. So this is the living word of God. And when I read it, I want you to hear it that way. This is the living word of God. We pray that, as we talked about yesterday, that we might not just hear it, but believe it, and that this living word of God would change us from the inside out. I want to say thank you to all those who've made comments either on Facebook or on YouTube or on Rumble, or they sent me texts or emails or wherever, you know, wherever you have made your comments. And I read all of them. I respond to as many of them as I can. I noted that when we finished the book of Leviticus, which, you know, that's a challenging book for most contemporary Christians, but I got a lot of comments from people saying thank you. And somebody said, I don't really understand all this, but I enjoyed it. And somebody else said with complete honesty, I'm not sorry that we're finishing the book of Leviticus. I understand that it, it can be a difficult book, but it's great. We can go through the whole word of God together and we're taking it at a pretty good clip. So uh, if today's reading didn't hit you, just stick around because tomorrow, tomorrow's reading or the day after is probably going to be the one you really need to hear. Now, we're in the gospel of Luke. Jesus is the great son of man the ideal man. He is the, it's Luke, the beloved physician is writing, not for a primarily Jewish audience, but primarily a Gentile audience. Jesus, the ideal man, the son of man, who is also the son of God. So today, three long chapters. Uh, so let me just give you something to look forward to in each chapter. Chapter seven, the healing of the centurion's servant, the centurion's servant. Uh, this is a wonderful, glorious story about the faith of a Roman centurion greater even than the faith that Jesus saw among the Jewish people. Then in chapter 8, just at the very beginning of chapter 8, Luke, I told you, has a lot of interest in the women in and around the life of Jesus. Note how he lists them out. He alone among the gospel writers focuses on the women who supported the ministry of our Lord. And then in Chapter 9, we go from the centurion to the women to Herod. Herod, who is troubled and perplexed, has a guilty conscience because he put John the Baptist to death. And when Jesus arises in his ministry, Herod is both fascinated, perplexed, and fearful. We'll see all that, plus a lot more in today's reading. And as always, our prayer is open our eyes, Lord, that we could behold wonderful things from your word. Luke 7, when he had concluded saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. A centurion servant who was highly valued by him was sick and about to die. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, requesting him to come and save the life of his servant. When they reached Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, he is worthy for you to grant this because he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Jesus went with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to tell him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, since I am not worthy to have you under my roof. This is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I, too, am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes into my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus heard this and was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found so great a faith even in Israel. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant in good health. Afterward, he was on his way to a town called Nain. His disciples and a large crowd were traveling with him. Just as he neared the gate of the town, a dead man was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. A large crowd from the town was also with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, Don't weep. 
Then he came up and touched the open coffin, and the pallbearer stopped. And he said, Young man, I tell you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Then fear came over everyone, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. This report about him went throughout Judea and all the vicinity. Then John's disciples told him about all these things. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord, asking, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men reached him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for someone else? At that time, Jesus healed many, many people of diseases, afflictions, and evil spirits, and he granted sight to many blind people. He replied to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. After John's messengers left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes. See, those who are splendidly dressed and live in luxury are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And when all the people, including the tax collectors, heard this, they acknowledged God's way of righteousness because they'd been baptized with John's baptism. But since the Pharisees and experts in the law had not been baptized by him, they rejected the plan of God for themselves. To what then should I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to each other. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but you didn't weep. For John the Baptist did not come eating bread or drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with the perfume. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, they said, when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. A creditor had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, he told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That is why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. And then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Luke 8. Afterward, he was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary called Magdalene, seven demons had come out of her, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, Susanna, and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. 
as a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from every town, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds of the sky devoured it. Other seed fell on the rock where it grew up. It withered away since it lacked moisture. Other seed fell among thorns. The thorns grew up with it and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground. When it grew up, it produced fruit a hundred times what was sown. As he said this, he called out, Let anyone who has ears to hear listen. Then his disciples asked him, What does this parable mean? So he said, The secrets of the kingdom of God have been given for you to know, but to the rest it is in parable, so that looking they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seed along the path are those who've heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the seed on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, having no root. These believe for a while and fall away in a time of testing. As for the seed that fell among thorns, these are the ones who, when they have heard, go on their way and are choked with worries, riches, and pleasures of life and produce no mature fruit. But the seed in the good ground, these are the ones who, having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it, and by enduring, produce fruit. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a basket, or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand, so that those who come in may see its light. For nothing is concealed that won't be revealed, and nothing hidden that won't be made known and brought to light. Therefore, take care how you listen, for whoever has, more will be given to him, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has will be taken away from him. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not meet with him because of the crowd. He was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to see you, waiting to see you, wanting to see you. But he replied to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear and do the word of God. One day he and his disciples got into a boat and he told them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they were sailing, he fell asleep. Then a fierce windstorm came down on the lake. They were being swamped and were in danger. They came and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we're going to die. Then he got up and rebuked the waves, the wind and the raging waves. So they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, asking one another, Who then is this? He commands even the winds and the waves, and they obey him. Then they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When he got out on land, a demon-possessed man from the town met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes and did not stay in the house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and said in a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torment me for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was guarded, bound by chains and shackles, he would snap the restraints and be driven by the demon in two deserted places. What is your name? Jesus asked him. Legion, he said, because many demons had entered him, and they begged him not to banish them to the abyss. A large herd of pigeons there feeding on the hillside, the demons begged him to permit them to enter the pigs, and he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the men who tended them saw what had happened, they ran off and reported it into the town, into the countryside, and people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man the demons had departed from sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Meanwhile, the eyewitnesses reported to them how the demon-possessed man was delivered. Then all the people of the Gerasene region asked him to leave them because they were gripped by great fear. So getting into the boat, he returned. The man from whom the demons had departed begged him earnestly to be with him, but he sent him away and said, go back to your home and tell all that God has done for you. And off he went, proclaiming throughout the town how much Jesus had done for him. When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Just then a man named Jairus came. He was a leader of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house. 
because he had an only daughter about 12 years old, and she was dying. While he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years, who had spent all she had on doctors and yet could not be healed by any, approached from behind and touched the end of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When the when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. Someone did touch me, said Jesus. I know that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him. In the presence of all the people, she declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, Someone came from the synagogue leader's house and said, Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, Don't be afraid. Only believe, and she will be saved. After he came into the house, he let no one enter with him except Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning for her, but he said, Stop crying, because she is not dead but asleep. They laughed at him because they knew she was dead. So he took her by the hand and called out, Child, get up. Her spirit returned, and she got up at once. Then he gave orders that she be given something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. Luke chapter 9. Summoning the twelve, he gave them power and authority over all the demons to heal diseases and to heal diseases. Then he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Take nothing for the road, he told them, no staff, no traveling bag, no bread, no money, and don't take an extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. If they do not welcome you when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and traveled from village to village, proclaiming the good news of healing everywhere. Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about everything that was going on. He was perplexed because some said that John had been raised from the dead. Some said Elijah had appeared, and others that one of the ancient prophets had risen. I beheaded John, Herod said, but who is this I hear such things about? And he wanted to see him. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus all that they had done. He took them along and withdrew privately to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out, they followed him. He welcomed them, spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and healed those who needed healing. Late in the day, the twelve approached and said to him, Send the crowd away so that they can go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find food and lodging, because we are in a deserted place here. You give them something to eat, he told them. We have no more than five loaves and two fish, they said, lest we go and buy food for all these people, for about 5,000 men were there. Then he told his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. They did what he said and had all of them, had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them. He kept giving them to the disciples to set before the crowd. Everyone ate and was filled. They picked up 12 baskets of leftover pieces. While he was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, still others, that one of the ancient prophets has come back. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. But he strictly warned and instructed them to tell no one, saying, it is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and be raised the third day. Then he said to them all, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words... The Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and that of the Father and the holy angels. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. 
About eight days after this conversation, he took along Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were in a deep sleep. And when they became fully awake, they saw his glory in the two men who were standing with him. As the two men were departing from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud appeared and overshadowed them. They became afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. After the voice voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. They kept silent and at that time told no one what they had seen. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, because he is my only child. A spirit seizes him. Suddenly he shrieks, and it throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth, severely bruising him. It scarcely ever leaves him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Jesus replied, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. As the boy was still approaching, the demon knocked him down and threw him into severe convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all astonished at the greatness of God. While everyone was amazed at all the things he was doing, he told his disciples, let these words sink in. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement. It was concealed from them so that they could not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. An argument started among them about who was the greatest of them. But Jesus, knowing their inner thoughts, took a little child and had him stand next to him. He told them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. For whoever is least among you, this one is great. John responded, Master, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow us. Don't stop him, Jesus told him, because whoever is not against you is for you. When the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up, he determined to journey to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of himself, and on the way they entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparation for him, but they did not welcome him because he determined to journey to Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. As they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. Lord, he said, First, let me go bury my father. But he told him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to those at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one, who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for the kingdom of God. I have a friend down in Texas who talks about getting down to the short roads. That's when, you know, you, you start here, you've got the big roads, you're cutting diagonally across the field. And when you get near the end, you get down to the short roads. Always means you get down to the nub of things. It's, As an expression, it means you're getting down to what matters most. Here in the end of chapter 9, getting down to the short rows of life. All this stuff, all these stories worthy of great pondering. But as I was just reading this, follow me, follow me. But the first man didn't understand what the cost would be. You understand, you follow me, we're not going to be staying at the Holiday Inn. Follow me, he said to another, but first let me go bury my father. 
what the dead bury their dead. You go and spread the good news of the kingdom. I'm going to follow you, a third guy said, but let me go say goodbye. And Jesus just said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. They are the cares of this world, legitimate cares, which we do have to take care of. Then they are the cares and the affairs of the kingdom. So let us pray today. Here's the challenge. At least this challenge for me. We're down to the short roads of life now. May we not merely say we're going to follow Jesus, but may we follow Jesus. Let's take care of the affairs of this life, family and friends and all of it. We got it. We have things we all have to do today, but we are put here to follow Jesus and to serve him. So may we not be found among those who put the hand to the plow and look back. But having said, we're going to follow Jesus. May we have the grace, courage to follow him today, wherever he leads. So Lord, that's our prayer. We want to follow. Lead on, O King Eternal. We will follow. By your grace, we will follow wherever you lead us today. So let's go out and serve the Lord. Have a great day, folks. Come back tomorrow. There's a whole lot more coming in the gospel loop. God bless. See you back here tomorrow.